All right, everyone, welcome to Course of Action. My guest today is Sarah Adams. She's an award-winning targeting officer and global threat advisor, the chief operating officer of the Ukraine NGO Coordination Network, and of course, the author of Benghazi, Know Thy Enemy. Sarah, how are you? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Of course, yeah. I'm looking forward to asking some questions uh, about your career and kind of some of your experiences and kind of clarifying uh, a few things that I think are kind of false in the media that I think you have some expertise on. Uh, but first, I want to ask you, what is the Ukraine NGO Coordination Network? Yeah, um, basically a month before the war in Ukraine kicked off, a bunch of like volunteers got together to kind of start brainstorming like how can we go into Ukraine and collaborate among different, like, you know, um, nonprofit organizations? How can we share resources, do information sharing, all those type of things? Because a lot of us have volunteered during the fall of Kabul and we learned from our mistakes and coordination issues. So we said, hey, let's go in and do a better job because the first thing we did when we went in, as you can imagine, is run um, evacuations. And so that's what we did pretty much most of the first three to four months. So we've been, we've been in, this fight has been in Ukraine for what, two, two plus years now? Yeah, we're at two, crazy. What is, since you're kind of involved, um, what is the situation kind of on the ground now in Ukraine with the government, our government, the U.S. government hasn't, you know, approved any additional funds to go there. And it's been since what, October, since they've kind of kicked this whole continuing resolution around, um, what is, what is the situation on the ground now that funds have been gone for six months now? Yeah, I mean, obviously people's spirits are still high, but as you can imagine, they've had to give up ground because they're, they're lacking some of the necessary items to keep war going at a certain um, tempo, if that makes sense. So so it is a stressful time for the war fighters. Obviously, the, the NGOs are just, just going along trying to make things happen, right? Um, but as you can imagine, it's just the, the, the psyche and um, the impact of just giving up any ground is uh, difficult for everybody, as you can imagine. It's, it's, it's just a tough war. Mm -hmm. And then even when you give up ground and eventually you get it back, you go in and you just see some of the most horrible things you can imagine. There's a lot of atrocities. And then you got to put a lot of aid into those areas, too, just to get basic services going again. So giving up ground is just going to be... <laughs> more work six months from now for a lot of these volunteers so you know it, it is a frustrating thing as you can imagine is this sustainable for much longer for ukraine without funding or are we going to eventually give russia the the tactical advantage you know not having this funding yeah i mean the, the unfortunate thing for everybody was right like russia planned this to be a short war like just mm -hmm. a few months right and it's gone on for two years so I do think people need to plan if this is going to be a long-term war, then we're committed to a long-term war. I feel like we commit to the war like three months at a time, but that's not sustainable as now we're seeing. So, so decisions do have to be made. You know, are we in the fight or are we not? And if we're in the fight, we got to stay committed. Obviously that's the key to being an ally. It, that's a, and that's a good segue into my next question of what does, what does our involvement in Ukraine, uh, say to our allies as far as commitment goes um, because we're, we're kind of incrementally funding it and being involved and being in the media and then, oh, we're not funding it. We're, we're in fighting. We can't even fund ourselves. What, what does this say to our allies? Well, even from the beginning, it's been pretty tough in Ukraine, as you can imagine, because we were kind of in the beginning, like, you know, oh, first we we're saying, oh, it's okay if Russia maybe takes a little bit of ground, and that was frustrating for the Ukrainians. Then we had a lot of hand-wringing over what weapons we're going to give and what we're not and what yeah. we're willing to. And then over time, we gave more and more, but we just should have gave them what they need when they needed it, right? So I think we have been an uneven partner the entire time. So I don't think this has been a huge shock for them. But as you can imagine, just American politics, even to get stuff done in our own country, it's not reliable. So allies know, unfortunately, we're already not reliable. But of course, you know, when people die, that, that, that's the worst thing. And so it's yeah. just, it's a problem with our broken system. Just it's frustrating for us even, right? Just our own issues. So yeah, it just needs to be fixed. Yeah, we're we're still dare, staring down the barrel of another continuing resolution. And I work at the Air Force Base here. Um, and being a veteran, you know, we dealt with it 
on active duty, uh, it's get it gets very tiresome, and people hate hearing the initial CR. And it okay. this year just seems like an anomaly. I know it's election year, and that was going to be kind of a political ploy, but it just really feels like this year it's it's beyond that. Like we're we're seeing the parties infighting with the, within each other, especially the Republican Party, and you kind of just wonder like man, they just don't have it together. Like, we can't support Ukraine. It's sending a negative message to our allies. It's sending China a message of, we're not probably even prepared to go toe-to-toe with you because we can't even get our mess together Mm -hmm. here. I'm shocked they haven't invaded Taiwan yet just because I feel like we're on our heels and we're vulnerable. It's just one of those things that really makes you go, how can a superpower like us not have our stuff together? It's concerning. Yeah, and I mean, the problem is we now really have politicians on both sides who just want to see each other fail. Like, you know, my opinion is just vote them all out. I mean, they're failing us. The, it's yeah. both parties. Mm-hmm. They care about each other first. They care about the other party second. They care about their broken system third. Like, they don't care about us at all. And, you know, Americans need to see that. And we need to just start running better people. Don't care if we find someone who can raise the million dollars for the party. Who cares? Like, we need to change the system. Yeah, I was talking to a... Uh a Miami vice uh, narcotics cop uh, earlier this week. And he had, he had done some dealings with the DEA and, uh, and a bigger federal government new to the nature of being down in Miami and, you know, all that cocaine just coming in and all the money laundering and all that that's going on, just absolute wild stories. But he told me mm-hmm. that the amount of federal politicians that were down there in their business and looking around and how much he saw the corruption, like, these guys weren't not getting along. They were getting along. But as soon as the cameras flipped on, totally different story. So he's like, they're just pulling the the wool over the Americans' eyes and just saying, hey, yeah, we, we hate each other. because, And then, therefore, you have to hate each other because you're party aligned. And it's such corruption. It's, it's embarrassing. Yeah. I call it politicking. You know, I worked in Congress for a couple of years. And, yeah, they're buddies. They go to dinner at night and then they stand in front of cameras and say the things that'll get people enraged, right? Um, and it, and it, it, it's a sick way to handle things. And I think everybody's just getting frustrated with it too. It's going to implode. So either they fix it or we kind of like end their system for them. Yeah, I think we're getting close to people looking across the aisle at each other and saying, yeah, we don't agree with each other, but like we really don't agree with these guys. Like it's gotten mm-hmm. to a point where they're not even listening to us when we agree with them. So uh, that's that's dangerous, I think, for our country. It's very, very dangerous. And it's very dangerous for our allies. And, of course, their enemies who want to see us fail, we're doing it for them. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean. Yes. Uh, um, they're, 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 the enemies are benefiting the most. That's yeah. factual. <laughs> yeah, they are. And this is coming from someone who worked in intelligence, who knows <laughs> The, where those battle lines are and who's listening, who's watching, and, and the really deep importance of that. And for, for you to say that and for other people, I'm sure, in the community to echo it is kind of concerning. Um, but when did you when did you decide, like, I'm going to join the intelligence community? I'm going to be a member of the CIA. How did that start? Yeah, I mean, it was really just in graduate school. You know, my focus had been the Kashmir region of India and Pakistan, so it kind of <laughs> limited job options to pretty much the CIA. So Mm -hmm. um, that's when I was like, I love working this topic. I'm really interested in terrorism. And then I, you know, I applied to CIA basically the night before I um, defended my graduate thesis. And then I got in about like six, seven months later. And then, um, you know, I've been kind of focused on terrorism. I've worked a lot of issues since, but, you know, my passion is obviously terrorism. And I'm going to always work it probably. (laughs) Can't get away. Yeah. And you worked in uh, that part of the world for like the majority of your career, right? Yeah, probably about half my time at the agency. Um, that, that's where I was. That was my focus. So being being kind of an expert on terrorism, um, our southern borders are a problem. I think any, uh, any warm-blooded American can look at it and go, there's issues there from the immigration process to the actual security, the violence, the drugs, you name it. Um, I think something that people often overlook is um, the vulnerability of the southern border. Are, are terrorists coming through the southern border? Yeah, and I mean, 
one of the things that I really think people don't focus on is like they hear terrorism right in the like they checked out because it's something they're not familiar with. And even when we were in Libya after the fall of Gaddafi, and we were talking to the Libyan government at the time and being like, hey, all these terrorists are flowing in your borders. Even they like couldn't grasp it, which is crazy because they fought terrorism their whole career. It was like always in their country. So the scary part is, right, until someone's directly impacted, they don't understand it. But because they're not directly impacted, they do not understand that like thousands of terrorists have been pouring into our country these last two years. And once they get inside, getting them out even finding them if they're here on fake identification documents, it's like nearly impossible until they do something. And it's pretty scary now we have to wait until they do something. Like we can't even just go detain people, right? Because they haven't committed a crime in the United States yet. And one of the other things a lot of people don't realize in a lot of these countries, like the, the, the terrorists coming from Syria, for example, we don't have relationships with that government. So we don't get like criminal records, like there is no way to properly vet these people. You know, Afghanistan is issuing passports to anybody from any nationality in any name, right? So so it ruins any opportunity to vet them too. So you don't even know when someone at the border says, right? Oh, I'm Afghan, are you? <laughs> you're, you're, you could have been an Iraqi terrorist that we held in custody for five years or something. Like it's, it's really a broken system. And, and I really don't even think we're doing biometrics well. So I'm just really nervous about even the people who are coming through the border and we are saying we're vetting besides than all the ones coming through and like nobody even touches them, which is 10 times that number, right? So, so it's pretty scary. And then just other things, criminals, human traffickers, drug smugglers, child rapists. I mean, there's just so many problems coming in. How do you think Governor Abbott down in Texas has kind of handled this, considering the fact that he's been up against an administration um, for for, a while, for quite a while now, dating all the way back to, you know, even back to the Clinton years? Um, the southern border has been a, a subject of controversy and questioning. Um, how do you think Abbott's handling it? Yeah, well, you know, it kind of becomes difficult, right? So my undergrad in international business, international economics, I live in San Diego. So I understand the border issues well and never what I've said, close the border, right? But we allowed so much to happen to where there is no reprieve. Like we honestly, he, you kind of have to close the border. Even you have to vet the, the millions who've come in, you have even the a legitimate good asylum cases, they're all backlogged. We have actual legal immigrants in this country now getting pushed to the side for these backlogs, right? Like someone has to say, stop the bleed. Let's fix whatever's happened these last couple of years and then restart any sort of immigration. And I know people don't want to do that, but we just we have to stop immigration at the southern border. It's the only way to fix the, the insanity that's occurring. So I think he's doing what he needs to do, but I think every state at the border needs to be doing the same exact things. You know, screw the politics. Like it's about national security at this point. Right. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think the Southern border states really need to come together. And I think that, I think that's mm-hmm. going to be difficult, difficult with California. Um, uh, unfortunately, and it's such a beautiful state that seems to just have, have had a rough go of it lately. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm, yes. And you know, our politicians are so corrupt and the way they cleaned up San Francisco when was it, was it, uh, I can't remember who came to visit from China. Yeah, Z went. Well, yeah. Boone and I went the week after he came and I could not believe it because I have been to San Francisco, obviously in the mess it's been in the last year or two. And I could not believe how cleaned up it was. And to be honest, we actually talked to a lot of people in town, um, town and they were really offended by just the fact that, oh, the government can do this and they did it for a foreign leader. They don't care about us. And and I really do think, I don't think the tide's going to turn that much in California, but I do think a lot of people in California at least are leaving, being like, okay, they're not in this for us. They're not protecting us. They're not doing right by us. And so there's a ma- mass exit out, you know? I've heard that there's places like, um, places in like Los Angeles and some of the nicer places where you really don't, you can't go to them anymore because, 
Um, a lot of the nicer stores have closed down and moved out because of the laws regarding criminal activity and what they can actually charge you for. And like, I can't remember, don't quote me. I want to say the, the amount for an actual felony for stealing something was like $10,000 was something outrageous, mm -hmm. um, outrageously yeah. high. Um, it was almost saying, go ahead. We're not going exactly. to do anything. And you have these beautiful shopping areas of of California, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and they've all pulled out and said, We're not gonna we're not gonna stay here anymore because you're just letting this happen and there's nothing being done. Like you don't respect us. Like and then you don't respect the citizens when you just clean up when a foreign leader comes into town. Like you just showed them like we have the capability to do it, but we're we're not gonna do it for you, but we're gonna do it for him. Well, you then you've sold your soul. We know who you sold your soul yeah. to. And besides like the theft of merchandise, think about it. When people are coming into these stores and committing criminal acts, you actually hold insurance on your business, right? And insurance companies aren't gonna want to insure you because of this liability too. So Good it gets point. even expensive besides being stolen to operate in these places too. So you know, it almost just puts you know, businesses out of work, right? These poor people, if you have a small business. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so, so embarrassing. Let's, um, let's shift over to your work, uh, in the Middle East. You wrote a book called Benghazi, Know Thy Neighbor. Um, obviously uh, I've seen you on several different interviews and for people who haven't, you really need to go, uh, watch uh, Sarah on a lot of different interviews, especially the Sean Ryan show. I think that was my favorite, uh, the way you guys got into things. Um, but you, you wrote this book because of your involvement the night of the Benghazi attacks and kind of leading up to it. Um, at what point in time did you kind of realize, okay, our government is, it, it just put, pulled their foot off the throttle? Yeah, I mean, the key part was a lot of people think it was earlier than it was, but I joined the Benghazi committee in, in January 2015. So this was the one run by Trey Gowdy. Um, and I was about a few months into the committee. I was actually at CIA headquarters and I had an interaction just in the, in the elevator of the building with someone I knew would have been working that account. And he made this comment like, I wouldn't touch Benghazi with a 10 foot pole. And this guy was like such a go getter. And like, he's someone I would have always worked with. And I was like, wow, someone like him isn't touching Benghazi. And I remember leaving headquarters and calling Boone. And I said, CIA is not working. The Benghazi attackers, like we've been assuming they are, but they're not 100%. He's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah. And so that's the second we decided to do investigation. And then I obviously, we went and did an investigation on our own and we proved it, right? Um, and when the book came out, we had people from the CIA reach out to us. I mean, we've had people cry saying, yeah, my bosses wouldn't let me. I wish I would have pushed back. Um, we had conversations where um, they were told not to collect stuff. It could affect the FBI investigation, which we, you know, wasn't really going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of political influence into not going after our hackers. So we're actually very thankful we did it. And we're very thankful we get to show people this happens because it hasn't just been the Benghazi attacks, right? We're now just the first people to prove, hey, here is how it's done if you do the job right. And if the government was to do it ethically and go after our attackers. And I think uh, there's a lot of misinformation about what kind of happened that night and who gave us authority uh, to do what? Um, I think I heard you say the Libyan government basically said, hey, you guys do do your thing, do what you need to do. The gates are open, you know, do your thing, send whatever you want to in there. Um, I think President Obama said something very similar. Um, where he was after that is in question um, and concerning. Uh, and then, of course, Hillary Clinton. A lot of people don't like her. She does some bad stuff. I'll, I'll admit that for sure. Um, I think there's some misinformation about, you know, how she handled it and how people tie it to the server. Can you kind of explain how that kind of got meshed together in her uh, actual actions? Yeah, like that's a little misconstrued. I mean, I do think she probably deleted some emails from the server that night, if that makes sense. But the server really has no impact on our Benghazi attacks. Our Benghazi attacks were planned by Al Qaeda. The issues with the server were some of the business dealings she was doing to make money off of Libya right after the fall of Gaddafi. It was kind of like business 
type of stuff. I mean, it, you know, um, financial type of stuff, you know, nothing really to do with terrorism per se, but people lumped the two because it ended up being the Benghazi committee who found out she had a server. And then people thought, oh, the server has all these secrets about the Benghazi attacks. And really the issue was like Jake Sullivan, who's our national security advisor, he's the one who made the fake Benghazi protest narrative. And mm. then, you know, President Obama, Hillary Clinton, Susan Rice, Ben Rhodes, right? They all jumped on this train, even though they knew in real time Al Qaeda was there. So they knew that night Al Qaeda was involved and they they ran a political narrative and, and you know, and, and they all did the wrong thing for that. And like I said, the, the, the server is just, I don't, people get wrapped around it. It's really yeah. not the point. Um, but I feel like people... People like to focus on things that'll suck in all the energy and Hillary Clinton sucks in all the energy and then you don't actually have to do things. So it benefits both parties, right? If it falls on Hillary first, they don't have to do anything with Jake Sullivan and he's really failing as our national security director. And then the Republicans never really have to do their job either, right? Because we had a Republican president during this time for four years that could have went after a Benghazi attacker and he didn't, right? So both parties just play this game and so they don't actually have to do anything. And it's a very frustrating thing. And I wish people would see this and like not participate in it. Yeah, and that's something I really wanted to ask you about because of course when something like that happens, you know, the media swirls and then of course it all it takes is one little sentence and then the actual narrative of it and the actual intelligence of it uh, kind of goes in a different direction. And then the real intelligence that's really being collected and gathered in real time, people sit, people, I think people disconnect this and correct me if I'm wrong. I think people disconnect this and they assume, Oh, the intelligence that we're getting intelligence with air quotes uh, that we're getting from the media is directly from the CIA directly from the <laughs> ground zero. This is this is the news. And then they just, that's that's what they carry forward. And so they connected the server to Hillary and to that night and to that attack. Like, am, am I right on that, the way that works? Because intelli- CIA is not publishing Facebook posts. Say, hey, guys, guess what we just learned? And, and putting it out there for people to see or sending it to Fox News. People, people run with that, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the server obviously became conspiratorial, but for due cause, she deleted so many emails on yeah. it, right? Um, which Definitely I know she, she wanted things not seen. They weren't exactly the Benghazi attacks. I'd love to see an investigation to what she was doing, right, yeah. in Tripoli, um, on the economic end of things. That's mm-hmm. where the investigation is. But, you know, to be honest, even the intelligence community is part of the failure in Benghazi. So one of the things, if you actually read our committee report, we point out that like the NSA went and took crappy press reporting and put it as like a lead comment in a SIGINT report saying, hey, a protest started at 5 p.m. in Benghazi. They just grabbed it from like a article and then everyone started classifying that as TSSCI and they're like, oh, it comes from NSA. And it's like, no, NSA dropped a sentence in from a press report, which they never should have done. And then everybody kept trying to collect info that backed this top secret information. So just the the, the failure of intelligence, the failure of an analyst, the failure of people to actually say, hey, the information doesn't point to this, right? We got real Al Qaeda guys on the ground here. Um, that's the part that's really frustrating because you're not supposed to just fall in line behind politics. You're supposed to say, here's what the evidence shows. And that's what I'm presenting in front of you because I'm an intelligence professional and that's my job. And that's where people went wrong. They got too involved in the politics of it and the politics and the politics are rooting the intelligence community. And it didn't just start in Benghazi. There's a lot of complaints that happened in Iraq. We sure, know what's yeah. happened in Syria with ISIS. It's happened in Benghazi. It's definitely happening right now in Afghanistan. So, so something has to happen, right? So we have we can't be the same people here saying, "Guys, stop this," and then just watching it happen over and over again. Yeah, I'm a big believer that I think there should be there's some positions within the government that should not be political appointees. And if you look going back 20, 30 years. 
um, at the amount of political point appointees per administration, it's just slowly grown to a point where mm-hmm. it was it was a cabinet, and then it was oh well this guy oh in this position and that position, and now it's to a point where there's hundreds of political appointees as soon as a new administration gets into office and it's months Mm -hmm. of senate hearings and and questioning these folks and it becomes this big political ruse and the next thing we know well the government's operating without a lot of these heads of these different agencies for months on end other people are taking their jobs for the meantime and and then you completely shift policy into I saw it several times with the DOD every time we got a new sec def. Uh, I know you've seen <laughs> mm-hmm. it, you know, and and it's just like, what are we doing here, guys? This is yep. ridiculous. It's really ridiculous. And because we live in these short-term timelines, right, of mm-hmm. like two years and four years, we can't strategically compete with someone like China, right, who does 100-year timelines. Yeah. Like the U.S. has to restructure in some way where we at least in some parts of our government can compete with our enemy in that way, because yeah, our policies just don't stay in play long enough for any of them to become successful and for any of them to have actually any kind of measurable outcomes. Yeah. And we look at a country like China and we say, Oh, well he's put himself into, you know, into the office for basically eternity, but he's going to have to die in that (laughs) office before somebody else gets uh, put in it. Uh, and we sit there and go, oh, wh- you know, what a dictator, you know, how is that? But you know what the narrative is? To give them credit a little bit, um, that's not going to change. So the policies, the strategy is not going to change unless he says so. So mm-hmm. they almost have the ability to change on their own terms, whereas us as a country, as the United States, we don't have that luxury anymore. Uh, the vote is not going to change that, unfortunately. Uh, our, our vote is almost... Mm-hmm it's been devalued to the point where um, these guys in fight so much and they go wishy-washy so much that, you know, uh, like you said, every two years, every four years, like, you know, a president could get into office and have a, uh, his party run Congress. But two years from now, that is likely going to change because the other party just has to wait you out. I'll make it difficult for you for the (laughs) next two years. We'll wait you out and then we'll take over enough seats to get the majority in at least one of the houses. And then the narrative's completely changed. So what do you get accomplished? And then reverse every policy, even the successful ones, because we want to not show you did something successful. It's like, it's insanity. Like all they do is work against each other. (laughs) Yeah. It's destruction of the, the political, you know, and the government strategy and the whole purpose of it, um, and it which is a which is another good segue into something I know you're an expert on um, is is the Taliban uh, and versus Al Qaeda, and there's a very very big and distinct difference. And I've kind of learned this through some of my research, uh, but you said it very well in another podcast I've heard you on is that um, Taliban is more of a government, and it, and if you go look up the Taliban, do some research online, you'll kind of see that. What is the main difference between the two of them? You know, I think we made that assumption and it was wrong. Mm. So I think what we did, which was right at the time, so obviously there was 9-11 planned by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Really, Taliban weren't involved. Maybe they hosted some training now and then, maybe one or two guys knew, right? But they really didn't have an involvement. So the people who made that assessment we're absolutely correct, right? But over 20 years, the groups have grown together to where even now the leaders of Al Qaeda are dual hatted with the Taliban, right? So the leader of Al Qaeda of a province, for example, is Taliban and he is Al Qaeda. There is hardly a separation anymore. Mm. They don't view it as a separation. Al Qaeda views Haibatullah Akunzada, right, as basically. The, the the senior kind of religious guy, even though he's Taliban, right? Um, and then, you know, they're planning together, they're training together, the funding is going together. So now it's very, very different. The Taliban and Al-Qaeda are 100% in bed together. You should not actually put a distinction between the two because that's not the way they actually view it. Um, so we have made some failures in focusing in the Taliban as a political organization instead of focusing on them as a terrorist group. And we made that mistake. And then think about it. All those years we asked 
Afghans. Tell me about how um, the Taliban's doing politics. Like we focused our intel collection on them as a political party, and we did not collect on their terrorist activities. So the lack of collection then made us make the wrong assessments on them too. And we were missing a lot of information on the Taliban in classified reporting because we weren't asking the right questions because we we're so focused on this concept of reconciliation and the Taliban have to be a part of a government, right? Like that's a power sharing thing. And actually we made the wrong assessments for 20 years. And I do think it's time we actually now stop it. At one point in time, the U.S. government wanted a peaceful reconciliation with the Taliban. And I know that was something that you had direct experience with. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, that's still what then happened. So um, 2008, 2009, President Obama put in the, this kind of like strategic guy to work reconciliation. He, he's passed away now, Richard Holbrook. He started this process and then it's just the same process that rolled along. So they made the assumption, hey, we're going to do reconciliation with the Taliban. And then they chose who in the Taliban they're going to do it with. And it was Mullah Abdul Ghani Berater. So I worked on his capture. So he was captured. Then the next administration, right, which was the Trump administration, stayed on the same plan. OK, we're doing reconciliation with the Taliban. They then called it a peace deal. And they still did it with Mullah Berater, right? And then we moved on to the, this administration and they just kept on the same path. We made this deal now with the Taliban that we started basically back in 2009 and we're sticking to our word, even though Taliban's breaking every single red line. Um, and then we just kept going on this plan we made so many years ago and no one stopped to be like, did we make the wrong assessment in 2009? And that's the problem. We've been making the wrong assessment. And that's why we need to change. The Taliban is a terrorist group, period. They're not a political party. And at one point in time, you had different authority with the Taliban in regards to your job, correct? Well, the thing is how it worked because the Taliban were never designated as a terrorist group, you had to target them as a political party, right? So it was very restricted who you could go after in the Taliban. Um, and then we had to go through many legal approvals to, to even go after the Taliban. That's why we were doing things like capture and vice, you know, it was a little more aggressive against, against Al Qaeda because you had lethal approvals. And again, that was another policy failure, right? Because it left all the Taliban senior leadership for the most part alive. We killed less than five in 20 years. And that's because of policy, not because we didn't have the best war fighters and the best, you know, technology, like we could have wiped them out. But we made these policy decisions who not only like got more of our people killed than probably needed to do, it kept the Taliban in power way longer. They ended up with more territory than they had in 2001, even before we withdrew. And then now, I mean, it, it's complete insanity. And now the Taliban then wants to project what they have out to other parts of the world. And now it's going to be very dangerous on um, the future plans that they have in store. So why, why didn't we change that policy in real time as we're, as we're realizing this or just, or did we just not, or were, were the right people not listening? Yeah. I don't think that we realized it in real time. I mean, people were trying to tell them, I even tried to reach out, you know, to Pompeo who was secretary of state at the time to just, even just tell him what I knew about Mueller Berater that I did not know when I was CIA, right? Like, you need to know these things if you're negotiating with this person because he's not a moderate. Like, don't listen to these people who are kind of, there's a lot of Taliban um, sympathizers in our government and there's a lot of Taliban lobbyists, right? Because remember, there was so much corruption out of Afghanistan that there is a lot of money flowing around. Mm -hmm. and. A lot of that money is in the hands of the terrorist side of Afghanistan, and, and it's given them a lot of power to politic in Washington, which is really dangerous, too. So, so unfortunately, I do think a lot of our State Department became Taliban sympathizers, and nobody moved those sympathizers out. And if they all have that group think of this is our plan, they, they weren't going to change it. But you can't even get them to change it now. They have no concept, honestly. Ooh, that just seems very... Very dangerous, dangerous way of thinking, a dangerous way of operating. And you mentioned projecting the Taliban, projecting uh, their power and their influence across 
the globe now. Not just Afghanistan, not just the Middle East, not even parts of Africa. We're, we're talking a global expansion now. Um, what do you know about their kind of their future plans and what they have in store? Yeah, I mean, they have different pockets of plans. So one of the main things is we want to help replicate, I mean, replicate our success other places, right? So they're doing some major outreach in that realm. And so they're outreaching to Libya, for example, the terrorists there. And it's Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Most of this is Taliban and Al-Qaeda. That's what I'm saying. People have to stop separating them. The Haqqanis are calling the Al-Qaeda terrorists in Libya. Al-Qaeda is calling and then they're calling them together. The other, the big, so the biggest push right now for the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Africa is they want to take Mali, right? So in the next so many months, they've just taken one of the senior leaders from Afghanistan and they shipped them to Mali. So you're going to see next from them this big Mali push, okay? So that's one piece. Another piece that they want to do is the whole Fata, I mean, they're saying bigger Fata, Kashmir, Baluchistan, but the first priority they have, and they're already started war gaming, is they want to take the FATA, so the federally administered tribal areas, they want to take them from Pakistan and roll them into Afghanistan. They're planning a war to do it. And then the last piece that they're working on is they want to take it to Saudi Arabia. So Al-Qaeda is mo- it's, Al-Qaeda is leading this piece, but they're planning terrorist attacks in Saudi Arabia to get Western countries to leave and abandon Saudi Arabia. So these are three of their big pillars that they've at least been working on these last two years that people really need to be paying attention to because it's important to them. So it should be also be important to us. So why, um, I think I know this answer, but for those listening, why, why is Saudi Arabia so important? Why would they want us to abandon them? You know, it's kind of one of those things that's probably emotional. I know it sounds really bad, you know? So like we have a Benghazi attacker, right? That's probably, he's like, we have a one or two on our list because he stole like a, a something that belonged to us. If that makes sense, he's probably not one or two if we rank them in number of importance, right? But we have this emotional connection to him and we put all this extra effort in because because we're affected by it. And that's kind of how the Saudi thing is, right? And it mostly falls on the Bin Ladens. So the Bin Ladens in Saifal Adel are leading this kind of thought that, hey, we're still here to take down Saudi. That's still going to be a priority. Um, and then we need to break the relationships between Saudi and the U.S. government and like Saudi and the Brits are like the two key ones they want to focus on, if that makes sense. And, and and that's really what it is, long historic. Remember, in these cultures, people hold grudges for very long periods of time. Like they could do it for a thousand years. Like it's not going away. They're just now refocusing and saying, we got to go back and make this a priority. If we, if we have to lose Saudi like that and the Western countries – have to basically are forced because of what's what goes on there um what does that do for global economics uh and and global peace when somebody like saudi arabia falls to the wayside because of taliban yeah i mean really what the thing is right it's basically what we do is we pull our embassies out of a country right that's the terrorist focus right i mean obviously we pulled out benghazi i mean we you know, the, the, the Sudan thing happened, we pull it in Afghanistan, right? That The terrorists realize this is a success, right? So that, that's their focus, right? They want to get us to pull, pull out. It then shows Saudis weak. Because remember, for embassies and consulate, it's that country's responsibility to keep you safe. So if the Brits or the Americans pull out of Saudi, Saudi is weak. Saudi can't keep them safe. And, and that's what they can play on and making Saudi Arabia weak obviously strengthened their case because they're just as equal as enemy to Saudi Arabia than us. I always tell people about this about the 9-11 attackers, right? If they weren't going to do our 9-11 attack and someone said, hey, can you also go attack, you know, X place in Saudi Arabia, they'd all sign up for it, right? It's like an equal enemy and we have to view it in the way they view it. And we have a very hard time viewing our enemy 
as they view things, if that makes sense. We make yeah. assumptions how we want them to do things. And then when they don't do that, it ends up being, oh, we had this big gap or, oh, we had this failure of imagination. It's like, no, you just don't know your enemy. Ooh, I think that's really, really uh, important. And um, I think I really wonder how many conflicts can we sustain being involved in and involvement is very loose um you know you got ukraine and russia you got the stuff going on in israel um at any minute now maybe multiple things could go off with china um and we have a lot of allies in that part of the world that we've pledged to protect whether orally in writing and agreements and treaties going back forever um, and then, of course, you have the hotheads in North Korea and Russia and China who could easily band together. And and then it's World War III. Uh, how, how many conflicts can we sustain before, okay, it could be World War III? Could, and you just mentioned Saudi Arabia. Do we, go, do we go in there? If the Taliban really start causing problems, do we go in there to protect them? Because they're an ally, right? I mean, it, it's really difficult. I really think... We're not going to jump on board, um, you know, back in Saudi Arabia unless like Al Qaeda pulls off one of these big attacks or planning, right? I think the biggest place we're going to go into next, if we had to support an ally some way, would obviously either be uh, Pakistan if the spots I think takes off, or if it becomes a shift in, in more of a Kashmir focus, if they think, oh, we can make more inroads on the Kashmir side and get more Pakistanis supporting our cause internally, you know, against the Pakistani government, you know, maybe it might be more, whoa, we need to kind of back India because India is such a strategic partner when we're looking at China and Russia. So I do think yeah. it would be more in that case, you know, it'd be the fear of Pakistani nukes or it would be, hey, we really got to step up for India because yes. of the unrest happening next to them. Yeah, I think India is such a strategic partner in that part of the world, South China Sea, and what really goes on there. I think losing India to anything would be detrimental to any kind of effort to quell China from pursuing things forward. I think they're doing things now because nobody's really doing anything. They're kind of getting that slap <laughs> on the hand from the global stage. Um, and the United States is sending a carrier group over there, but that's probably nothing really new. Like, you know, uh, we have that presence over there. Um, I think what I question is, what is it going to take before China finally says, okay, and gets brave enough to do something? Because I don't think we start, in my opinion, uh, I don't think we start the next world war. I think China does. I think it's just a matter of time before China says, okay, it's time to kick it off. I kind of look at China different only because I look at their long timelines and i'm not sure china gets a huge benefit from starting a war when china has the time to politically take over taiwan right and then we have no role right if they have if they take over all the politics of taiwan and all the influence and all the media will be a mute point right, <laughs> right. What, what social media does to different different pockets of the population so i really think like that's where China wins. And we saw them slowly do this on the economic side of things, right? So I'm not sure why people think, oh, economically, they were patient to get ahead and did these things. But oh, for Taiwan, they're not going to be patient. I really think we're kind of missing the ball um, on their plans and their patience. And they're benefiting from being patient, as you can see, because we're getting pulled into all these other conflicts. And it is stretching us thin. And it is only benefiting them. Mm, that's a good point. I didn't even think about their patience of it and uh, the media and the influence side of things. So you're right. They can easily, they could not, not a single bullet can be launched, not a single bomb could be dropped, and they could easily take over Taiwan because they're playing the long game, which I think is important. And the disinformation that's going on, and I want to talk, uh, talk about media and disinformation real quick before I let you go. Um, the media and disinformation is a huge narrative that's going on. What do you think the media narrative is, not just here, but on a global scale, is in regards to global conflict? And how is it being misused and used to a tactical advantage? Yeah, I mean, 
The problem is all of the governments, right, and then all the political parties within every government, right, uses the media. Like the media is for influence, right? If you have a medium personality, he makes twenty million a year dollars a year. It's not for his knowledge, right? It's what who he can influence and what he can impact. And I think a lot of people just say, "Oh, I learned this from this knowledgeable person." It's correct, and they really need to like step back and say, "Who's influencing me? Is my government influencing me? Is a foreign government influencing me? Is just some crazy actor who wants to mess with all of this influencing me?" Right? Like, there's so many different things going on, and also just then the worst is who is influencing my children, the next generation? What am I not seeing? What am I not paying attention to? Because I am so consumed. With what is being fed to me, because one of the things is, remember, you're getting fed a ton and ton and ton of information, right? right? So, so you're not even clear about everything that's going on. You're not really the expert on anything. You're making assumptions, linking things that that don't even tie together, right? And that's the point of it, right? It's supposed to keep you confused. And so, I think people just kind of need to take a step back and be like, I'm being influenced, and I always make that assumption first. And then figure out why. When I was at CIA, we had something called the Open Source Center. It still exists. But the cool thing about it was, is they would take every piece of media from around the world, and then you would click on that. Let's I don't know. Let's say that Tokyo has a Daily Times or something. You click in it, it would say, you know, here's what they try to influence. Here's the way they politically lean, and you would understand all that. So then when you went to read it. Oh, they said it this way because they're trying to influence me in some way. But people don't view media that way, and they actually need to.、Um, and you know, we got to become better consumers, or we will fall into misinformation. Because more is information misinformation. It feels like than the less. Well, and and with the algorithms, the way the way the internet works now, and the way social media works now.、Um, You know, I guarantee after this conversation, I'm going to find stuff on my Facebook feed、uh, related to what we've talked about.、Um, it, it's just the nature of it. The way technology has advanced so much, where we gather information is is tenfold over what it was 20 years ago. So now, now you can literally be fed, even on your social media platform,、mm-hmm. on the commercials, on your streaming service, you can be fed exactly what they want you to be fed. And the, to your point. We have to start thinking as individuals beyond that. Instead of just taking it for face value and say, "Oh man, this is convenient. Like I just got told exactly what <laughs>、right. I wanted." You know, it's so nice. Granted, it is. It's super nice to for things to pop up when you need them to. And oh, you know, I didn't even think about that. I need to reorder that on Amazon. I'm glad they mentioned it. Like that's very convenient. At the same time, it is what is causing the problems because. If if so, a company like Amazon can do that, then a country like China can hack into it and do it too, and then、mm-hmm. China doesn't need to fight a war with the United States when they have the influence in the United States. And I think that's growing、um, to where there's there's going to be people eventually that are going to stand up and say, "Oh, we can't go to war with China." Well, you know what, what's wrong with China? You're gonna ha- just like、mm-hmm. you said that there's there's Taliban sympathizers within our very own government. There's people who believe. In the Taliban and what they were trying to do, they're on their side. It's just a matter of time before that happens with China. If it isn't already, well, it is already. Think of how many people stepped up to back up TikTok. Like, who cares? It's just an app, right?、Yeah. Apps die all the time, right? And I mean, and China is using TikTok to human traffic people through our southern border. Like, they're even they're using it for crimes. They're using it to traffic drugs. Um, besides the influence on our children, right? And then people back it up, so for, they don't know why. Almost, almost, right? It's like, oh no, this is something I want, and this is something I use, and I like need to like go to battle for it. And it's like you, you don't. You're being influenced, and so yeah, it, it, it's just this frustrating thing, right? It's like. Uh, I, I just, I just, I find it infuriating. Even you know, we can't have TikTok on U.S. government devices, and now the Biden administration made an account. So also stuff like that. It's kind of like you can't say we have a policy, and then you do the exact opposite, because then it shows you don't actually,、um, you know, respect those policies you're putting in place, and it almost looks like you don't take the China threat、um, involved in that app seriously too, and and that's a problem. 
Well, and I'm not uh, an intelligence professional by any stretch of imagination, but it just seems, even to me, it seems very clear that we no longer respect real intelligence. Um, and we, we, we're not willing to listen to it if it doesn't fit a narrative, even if it's the dead honest yeah. truth. You know, if somebody walked up to me and said, Jeff, you're a little overweight, that would hurt my feelings, but it's the truth that I needed to mm-hmm. hear. But it's kind of like we're willing to, in a lot of different terms, we're willing to walk up to people and say, man, you look fantastic. And just same thing with TikTok. TikTok's amazing. It's fantastic. No, it's not. What it's doing, it's a spy tool by China to infiltrate our country. And they did it by just simply creating it and uploading it to the app store. And then it went viral. Mm -hmm. Now everybody has. I have author friends who are like, Jeff, you need to get on TikTok. You need to do a TikTok <laughs> thing because there's a whole book TikTok you know, side that you can advertise on. I'm like, man, it sounds fantastic, but it's TikTok. You know, know. <laughs> it's just very concerning. So, um, well, Sarah, it's we've already burned through 50 minutes. Um, where can people go before I let you go? Tell people where they can go to get your book and follow along with you and all the good things you're doing. Yeah, sure. I mean, our book is just available on like Amazon, Barnes and Noble. A few months ago, we put on an audiobook. So if that's your thing, you can go on Audible or iTunes, for example. I mean, I'm pretty boring. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. And then if you have a good sense of humor, <laughs> we are on Instagram and it's at Ascari Media Group. It's A-S-K-A-R-I Media Group. But we spend most of the time making fun of Tara. So it is not an account for everybody. <laughs> so. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I follow you guys on Instagram <laughs> and I love it. So, uh, Sarah, again, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on here. I wish you the best of luck and all the awesome things you're doing in Ukraine. And again, just thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>